Hi, thanks for joining us online. We're so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you. Whether you're a regular here at LBCC, a fellow follower of Jesus, or maybe you're just someone who's looking to learn more about Jesus and what Christianity is all about. As a church, our aim is simple. We want to connect you to Jesus, the God who is the source of all life and goodness. And in doing that, we want to connect you to others because community is God's idea. And, and it'll help you walk toward, toward Jesus with others. We want to also help you grow. Grow as a whole person, grow in your faith. If you're going to be a Christian, you want to have a dynamic relationship with God and join others in that journey of faith. And finally, we simply want to help you find ways to invest your life, to be part of something bigger than yourself. When you join yourself to Jesus, you're part of the biggest mission that's ever been done on the earth. And you can impact your home, your family, the people you love, the people you work with. You can impact your town and your city. Today, we hope you'll be encouraged by the sermon. But here's some information on some upcoming events first. Our Sunday service is back in person at 9.30 a.m. Masks are not required, but are encouraged for those who are unvaccinated. We also invite you to join one of our other events as an encouragement on your journey to connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Check out our life groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some of them meet in person, some on Zoom. There are a couple times a month. And of course, visit our website or call the office at 732-870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now, here's today's sermon. Well, good morning. Trust that uh, you've come to change the way you look at things because that's what Paul is doing in the epistle to the Ephesians. I just felt, uh, while we're getting ready for this, I want to say good morning to all of those who are looking in. You're probably looking into this on the internet on Monday, so maybe it's not morning to you. But let's pray. Father, our example is that when Peter stood with the eleven on Pentecost, those who heard him were pierced by the word. And I pray this morning that you would pierce us that you wouldn't just give us feelings of joy or adulation, but that you would pierce our heart with your word, God, and that our lives would be changed, not because of me, God, but because of your spirit working and because of the word of God. I pray that whenever we come near your word, we should come humbly and we should come reverently, Lord, to hear from you. So I ask that you would speak to us this morning through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what we are, um, I have to do this here first. What, what we have been doing is looking at the epistle to the Ephesians. And this will always happen to me. <clears throat> and I've called it an uncovering of God's mystery. And that's what we, we understand the epistle is doing. Last week when we looked at it, we looked at, at just what God is doing with an uncovering. I'm getting a lot of feedback right here. Yeah, thank you. And so I called it um, Ephesians, God, Uncovering God's Mystery. And you see I put a very um, creative title for this as part two. That, uh, helps us understand it. And I'm just going to run through some of the things that I said last week that, that will help us just understand a little bit more, give us context for what I'm going to say this morning. And I, I should say this, let me back up a step and say this, that this epistle is so well crafted. Now, we would, we would assume that the Word of God would be well crafted, right? That's one thing we would assume. But there, there are some things like we, we don't spend a lot of time, say, in the minor prophets of the Old Testament. 
if we're on a reading plan, it's almost like you just want to get through it. You just want to say, check that box. We read through one of the minor pro like Obadiah. You know, nobody's really coming up with their life verse from Obadiah. Um, and we, we understand that they are, they are a, a different set of uh, books in the Bible. But one of the things, and I, and I borrowed this from the Bible Project from Tim Mackey, that, that the Bible is you know, a unified story that leads us to Jesus. And that's a very simple way to understand what we call biblical theology. And some months ago, I began a study that Tim Mackey basically does online on the book of Ephesians. And last week I mentioned that Ephesians was the first book when I pastored Community Gospel Church, which is the church that this church came from. I spent a year going through Ephesians. Um, I preached on it every week for a year. I can't remember, you know, that's over 40 years ago now. And um, I might have missed a week or been away for a week at some time, but I spent 40 weeks, 50 weeks, I'm sorry, on the epistle, at least 50. And it's always been my favorite book in the Bible. And if you're not allowed to have a favorite book in the Bible, I'm sorry. Um, but I have a favorite book, and it's Ephesians. I still read Ephesians quite regularly. Now, I love Hebrews. I love the Gospel of John. Those are the other two. Isaiah, I'm very partial to. Um, just kind of rambling off here, books that I really like to stay and read in. But Ephesians is, is unique. For, for instance, like there, every time it mentions the word you, our English word you, it's always plural in the Greek. It's never a singular you. It's always all of you. Uh, that's very interesting. The other thing that's very interesting about Ephesians, especially in chapter 1, Paul makes reference to the Father 31 times, just in the first chapter, what we call the first chapter. And that's unique. And really, some people call this the epistle of the Father because he is the focal point of this. Not that Jesus is focused on in this, but mostly he is... If I could say this most reverently, he is secondary. It is the Father causing all of these things, and Jesus is the medium that he, he moves through. And that's one of the ways that we understand this. But what Paul is doing here in Ephesians is he's telling us, first of all, that he's going to reveal something to us. He's going to show us something that, that we actually don't know. And basically, it's that there is a heavenly realm, and these two realms overlap. Now, if I had the time, I, I, would, I would show you that where these two overlap is where we are right now. And these two realms, the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, have always overlapped. It's just that in Christ now, because of the coming of the Holy Spirit, it's become more apparent to us. And when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, Peter basically, he quoted from Joel, and basically he said, this is that. This that's happening is that which Joel said back then. And if you take the time, you can read in the Old Testament the times that God revealed himself to people by uncovering himself. That word uncovering is the word apocalyptic. It's a apocalypse. And this is, this is Paul's unveiling or uncovering. And I said a bunch of other things last week about that. I'm sorry if you weren't here. You can go see it online at lbcovenant.org on YouTube. It's, it's, it's there. I checked this week to make sure it was there. But this overlap period, or this overlap right there that you see on the screen, is you could put the cross on, on the inside circle, or the, the inside that's covering the earthly, and you could put the second coming on the other one. And that's where we're living right now. We're living between the cross and the second coming of Jesus. And everything that's happening, God is marshalling us 
toward this heavenly realm or another day when he will create a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. And by the way, there will be a judgment when that happens. And that is my eschatology in a nutshell. This, this overlap, you could see it all the time. Here's a little tidbit for you. You know, this is free, no charge. The Holy Spirit, after creation, never acts without people after the creation of the universe. Every time you read in the Old Testament God acting, he's always in people or on people. Yeah. So what God does today is he uses, as, as JP and, and Cheryl just said, uses people. Yeah. And this is what we see from the day of Pentecost. So that was the first thing. <clears throat> I want to run through this. Th this word grabs me. It, it really takes hold of me. So if Ephesians is apocalyptic literature, and what does that mean? Well, we looked at three different meanings of it. One of them was literal, that we see that there is a literal meaning, there's a metaphorical meaning, and an associate meaning. The literal meaning is to uncover. It literally means to pull the blanket off of something, that there's something under the covers and you pull the blanket off it. The metaphorical meaning is, are things like the uncovering of an idea or a fact. And then there are associate meanings that Paul uses quite liberally, in, especially in the first chapter, about bringing things to light, illuminate, enlighten, and so on. So what we want to do is we want to understand this, this uncovering. And I saw, we saw the two realms, how they first go the, together. And Paul uses that word ministry, kind of running through here. Now, I changed some of the wording of, of the statement that I, I had up there last week. I said that Ephesians is an epistle or a letter announcing and inviting all humans to understand and respond to the uncovering. So that's what Ephesians is. It says once the uncovering is revealed to you, it changes the way you live. So what I think that Paul is doing here is he's telling us what his worldview is. Ephesians is the most clear picture of the way Paul makes sense of reality and then lives in it. And that's what a worldview should do. It should, a world, your worldview is the way that you make sense of reality. And if you think that the unseen realm that Paul is talking about is just some minor part of living, your worldview is wrong. It doesn't match up to the scripture. And one of the things that you always want to do as a Christian is to live as closely as you can to what God is revealing to us in the scripture. That was a good place to say amen. amen. Participation is like your side. You know, I'm doing my thing, you, do, you gotta help and do your side there. That's how we know this is participation. Okay, here's another way that I think of saying this. And that is, in Jesus, God has created a new humanity that is called to reveal God's wisdom to the unseen rulers and authorities. Now, we don't often think of ourselves as a new humanity, right? We just, if I'm honest, I think, sometimes I think that God just kind of like polished up a couple of the tarnished places in my life. Yeah? That when I, when I landed on my two feet after my conversion, I thought, I'm not that bad. I'm doing pretty good. I mean, look at them other people, how they live. I'm certainly not as bad as they are, and I didn't really need a total makeover. I just needed a little bit of polish to kind of, yeah. But Paul is a creature of habit, 
and he, he really starts this in so many other places, and I just took the liberty of writing these things out for us. He said, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. See, back then last week I talked about this, the Jews and the Gentiles are so, so far apart and that in Jesus they've been made one new man, one new humanity is the idea. And, and right into the Galatians he says, neither is vaccination anything nor unvaccination anything, but a new creation. Let me just, I just need to just. Sometimes I think I should study in public places. And I'd probably be a little bit more. Okay. So Paul writes this also. He says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Now, I never think of getting praise from God. It, it doesn't fit my worldview. I think I'm supposed to be praising him. But God says that if you are born again, you have a circumcision of the heart, and that's what makes you a real Jew. And it's done by the Spirit, not by hands. I didn't make this stuff up. This is actually in the Bible. This is in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. He's saying, you're not a Jew if you've just been circumcised in the flesh. He says, you have to be circumcised in the heart. Has to be a work of the Spirit in your life. Christianity is not hard. It's not difficult. It's impossible there's only one person that can live the Christian life, and that's Jesus. And he has to live through you by the Spirit. And that's how you live as a Christian. That's what Paul's going to get at in this epistle, because he's going to tell us how we do all these things. Is this good stuff or what? This is like really good stuff, isn't it? I was excited when I was seeing this stuff and putting it together. I was like, I can't wait till Sunday. Could we do this earlier? I love JP and Cheryl, but I was like, come on, come on, get it over with. Like, like, move it along here, you know, like uh, take the microphone away from that woman because she'll go on. I love her to death. And she's a preacher. That's the problem is that when you're a preacher and there's another preacher in front of you, you're like, come on, get it over with. Like, you know, let's, let's move it along here. Here's another one. This is from 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So this leads us all up to this. This is now, I looked last week at chapters 1 through 3 and actually presented what I thought were the messages that God was doing or using Paul to say to us about that. And remember we read in chapter 3, verse 10, where he said that the church might now make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And that was the whole purpose of everything he said. Broke down the dividing wall in chapter 2, took the Jew and the Gentile, made him one new man, and it was so that might now, now the church might demonstrate or reveal the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. That is the church's occupation. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what our job is, and it's to declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into light. And now Paul is going to tell us in chapters 4 and 5, basically, he's going to tell us how we ought to live. So what I did was I took the words walk, because he starts off this, this chapter, chapter 4, in this way. He says, therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you 
to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called. Notice the, first the repetition there. Walk in a manner of your calling with which you have been called. How, what, what's the manner that you were called in? It was according to his eternal purpose which he carried about in Christ Jesus from the Lord when he raised him from the dead and seated him far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, and gave him as, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's the manner in which we were called. I look for one thing in the Bible, glib verses. Haven't found any. Yeah. If you mess with the Bible long enough, it will stab you in the heart. It's meant to do that. It's meant to do that to us. And Paul says it here, he says, I implore you, that's the same word that Jesus used for the paraclete, for the Holy Spirit, who would walk alongside you and be your counselor, be your, the one who implores you to follow him. It's the same word. He said, I implore you, I, I paracletos you, to walk in this manner with which you have been called. So what is the manner that we've been called? It is according to the eternal purpose that he carried out in Jesus. And, and that's what our job is, to walk in this manner. We're to walk this way. And um, I'm going to tell you what that means. Just take notes on this, okay? Here's the way, what he says. Humility and gentleness. Yeah? You know what gentleness is? Gentleness is strength under control. Yeah. Humility is not thinking more highly of yourself. You heard of the story about the man who got the reward for being the, the award for being the most hum, humble person. They gave him a pin, so he wore it, so they took it away from him. Paul says, with humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, <clears throat> being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is enough to convict everybody in this room, including myself. Yeah. To, to walk in this manner with humility and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. <laughs> How many of you feel like you're really good at that one? I put my hands behind my back. And then being diligent. Say diligent just out loud. Diligent. You're diligent in the things that are important to you. The things that, you're, that are important to you, those are the things you're diligent in. The things that are not important to you, they're not, you're not diligent about. Like, I'm orderly, but not neat. I know what's in my mess. That's, you have to take it by faith, because in your mind, you think you've got to be orderly to know what's in it. No. Listen, here's what I, I'm, I'm 73. I know I don't look it. I have great-grandchildren. I know I shouldn't have great-grandchildren because I don't look like I'm an old guy. Why do you laugh at that? Why is, why, why is that funny? But, but I, I've, learned, <laughs> I've learned this through my life that I am, I am an orderly person. I'm just not neat. Creative people are like this. Every creative person I know is like this. That was your wife. You have to deal with her. And I'll, 
I'll talk about how you have to do with it later in this message here today. All right, we're, waste, we're burning daylight here. But now, okay, get you smiling for this. If we are diligent in, in preserving the unity in the bond of peace. Now, again, listen to the words. We're preserving, we're not making it. The unity of the Spirit is already there. If we're not preserving it, what are we doing to it? We're disrupting it. So we have to be diligent to act on keeping the unity of the, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And of course, Jesus, he himself is our peace. That's one of the things that we understand about him. Okay, so that's the way we do it. Now, Paul just, you know, the, the guy, you just want to say enough. Like, that was enough. You know, we, we'll, we're going to be on that for a while. But then he goes on and he says this. Here's the bond of peace. Here's the unity of the Spirit. One hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is Father of us all, over all, through all, and in all. That's the unity right there. One hope of our calling, that should unite us in 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 fulfilling the calling that God has put on our life. But then he demonstrates it by, listen, we only have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is a father of us all. We ought to be living in that. That ought to be the thing that really convicts us to be a people of oneness and not just people that are here in our, in our midst, in our congregation, but everyone who names the name of Jesus as their Savior that has been washed in the blood. We should be in oneness with them, and we should preserve the unity of the Spirit. Does that mean uniformity? No, absolutely not. You know, there are 300 types of apples. I don't know. How does that fit? I mean, God's just got this creative thing. 300 types of apples. I'm happy with like two types, three types, but 300? Come on. You know, th there are 10,000 different kinds of insects that live in one tree in the Amazon, Amazon rainforest that don't live in all the other trees. It's crazy. God isn't after uniformity. Like if you were God, you were going to make bugs. How many bugs, types of bugs would you make? Yeah, just one that I could recognize this is a bug. It's either deadly or not. Kill it, it's over with. You know? He has bugs you got to kind of look at, like, what the heck is that thing? In, in, in Africa, they have these grasshoppers. They, they, they look like they're cartoons. They are, they are painted, just mass, like somebody took this fine brush and put these rings around them. And I got them crawling. I mean, I'm looking at that. I'm saying, oh, my gosh, when did he have time to do this? <laughs> And it's just one. I have a picture of my wife like this. <laughs> Is it on me? <laughs> it's okay, just chewing on your shirt right now. It's just, no, okay. Getting loose here. He says, you are no longer to be children tossed here and there. He said, you're supposed to not be children tossed about by every wind of doctrine, by everything that's blowing through. My gosh, there's more stuff going on. But then he says this, don't walk as the Gentiles walk. In the futility, that is the, the mindlessness, the uselessness of their thoughts. Don't walk like they walk. He's writing to the Gentiles. And he said, don't walk the way you used to walk. You're a new creature. You're a new humanity. You're something totally different than you were before. And that's the thing that God has created through Jesus in us. And then he says this, put on the new man. <clears throat> he says, you know, here's the verse in, in verses 17 in, in chapter 4. He says, so I say this and affirm together with the Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
he's affirming with God that this is okay to say, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. What are they ignorant of? They're ignorant of the mystery that God has revealed to them. Because of the hardness of their heart, they haven't become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. And God, are we living in that today? He says, but you did not learn Christ this way if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus that in reference to your former manner of life you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. And help us, help us, God, to, to understand really the work that you've done in us. Amen. Next week, we're going to talk about the warfare that we're in because that's where Paul ends up. How do we maintain this stuff in this battle that we're in? But you realize that few of us think that I am a new creation in Christ, created in righteousness and, and holiness and truth. We think we just got the spots removed. We just polished up a little bit. But that's not what the Word tells us. Okay, second thing is he says, walk in love. He says, as Christ walked and loved you and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God. And the Greek there is really interesting because he says, as, as, as Jesus gave himself as a fragrant aroma to God. He offered himself. And that's the way he says that's how we should walk in love. That's powerful stuff. The, the one, one study you do in the scripture is you kind of see words, how the, the re repetition of words, and how they are um, joined to other words, words that appear. And I, I found one of my earliest word studies is how love and give always come together. That loving is giving. And it's not just giving of your things, it's giving of yourself. Jesus said this is how, or John said it, this is how we know love, that he gave himself for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So every time you see that action of love, you see this giving. And we give ourselves to God. And he says that as a fragrant aroma, you know what that is? That's a burnt offering. The picture there is that, that bullock going on to, you know, being slaughtered and being put on the, being put on the altar just to go up and smoke. Nobody gets to eat that. And in Israel, they had to do that every day in the morning and at the end of the day. They had to take one of the best bulls they had, blue ribbon bull, no spots on it, no blemishes it, kill it, slaughter it, and then take the whole thing, plop on the altar so that all day long you would see this column of smoke going up to the heavens. And everything would just disappear into ashes. That's what Paul is saying to walk in love. As Americans, we're taught to say, what's in it for me? Well, you're just smoke. Hopefully it's fragrant. Yeah. We, we, we heard from two people today, missionaries now, in their 60s, going to be a fragrant aroma. All they know is that God has called them. They don't know the outcome. They know what they'd like to do, but the, you can't get there unless you are that fragrant aroma, that you give yourself with that in mind. This could just be smoke. Hopefully that's all it is. That's what it means to walk in love. 
I could go off on something right. There's a rabbit hole that is just, I hear the voice of it. We talk about thankless jobs. That's smoke. That's a fragrant aroma. You might as well get God's blessing out of it. Because when we give ourselves, that's, that's what happens to us. We give ourselves as a fragrant aroma. And it's very hard when everybody is telling me, you know, it's my day. This is for you. Be all you can be. And we, it's like a voice that always gets in our mind. What's in this for me? Well, probably an eternal award, reward if you do it right. That there will be something that will resound throughout eternity. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we have to look for. Okay, so then he says, walk in light. If you liked walk in love, you're going to love walk in light. He says, do not be partakers with them. Getting ahead of myself. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light. In the Lord walk as children of light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. This is, this is church. See, this is what Christians are supposed to be doing. I have nothing against big churches, but sometimes I think they lose their way. I think the same thing happens to small churches. We lose our way. We forget what we're supposed to be doing. We forget what God has done for us, and we lose sight of what's happening. We, we, we forget who we're doing it for and the instructions that he's given to us. See, when I studied this book the first time, it changed my life. It, it was like I couldn't get away with it. It was like sticky paper all over me. I just couldn't get it off of me. I couldn't get away from it. And I started to see this is church. This is what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to put on the new man. Who's the new man? It's Jesus. Jesus is the new man. He's the one that, that lives through us. When I say the new man, you know I mean the new humanity. I don't want to be sound like I'm being sexist here. It's putting on this new humanity. Put that on because that's, that's the way we're supposed to live. And then we're supposed to walk in love. How do we do that? You know, it, it's not hard. It's not difficult. It's impossible. But when Jesus lives in you and lives through you, it becomes something attainable. Here, Paul even says that. He says, trying to learn what's pleasing to the Lord, meaning that there are things you will learn that are not pleasing to the Lord. And that's a very subjective thing. It's very subjective to know, to know that this, what I'm doing, is pleasing to the Lord. And I would say that the way that we really get the, the confirmation or affirmation that it's pleasing to the Lord, that we have a genuine peace about doing it, no matter the cost. So he says, don't pro participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. And... That's what we want to do. And there's so much you could unpack there. I hope you go home and read some of this. You know, what, it, what one of the things Paul says is that, that once you walk in the light, you become light. You know what that means? You make other people uncomfortable. Because you walking in the light and people love darkness rather than light. And you bring the light right to them. And... We, we're unconscious. We don't know we're doing it. Why does this person not like me? Because I'm exposing their deeds. Those of you who know my wife, 
she's worked for this particular company for 26 years when she first started there, someone came up to her and said, stop working so hard. You're making us look bad. Really? By doing my job? Yeah, because they were gold bricks. They were basically not doing their job. And they don't want someone to come in and say, this is the way you're supposed to do it. Yeah, that's what we do. He goes on to say this. He says, walk as wise, not as foolish. And there's a whole thing there when he talks about, about walking as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Don't give the devil any ground. Don't give him a place. Don't give him an opportunity. The days are evil. And that's something to understand that we, we walk and we live in a world where the days are evil. And, there, you know, you get so many hours in a day, he said, make the most of your time. Use your time constructively. When you get older, you really understand this better. You know, one of my favorite sayings today is we're burning daylight. We just got so much time. Your mortality becomes more of a reality as you get older. You realize you don't, when you're young, you think it'll never, I'll never get there. You know, it'll, the days will never be when I'm that old. And you, it, God willing, you will, you will get there. And you realize we're burning daylight. And you want to make sure that you use your days and your time usefully that really are something that is pleasing to the Lord. Don't be foolish with your time. Don't, 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 don't walk aimlessly through the day, but have some understanding. He said, understand what the will of God is or the will of the Lord is. What is it? Do the things that are fruitful in your life, but walk as wise people. So he says, put on the new man because that's going to help you understand how to live and, and give you the energy, the spiritual power to walk in love and to walk as light and, you know, learn the things that are pleasing to the Lord as you walk as someone who is wise and not foolish. Now, if, we ha if I had another three weeks on Sundays to go through it, we could have probably picked these verses apart even better. But he, he ends chapter, or this section he ends, where he says, be subject to one another. Hupostasis is the Greek word, to stand under. He said, be subject to one another because he's going to deal with wives, be subjected to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Children, obey your parents for that is the only commandment with a promise. Parents or fathers, don't exasperate your children. He's going to give us a social order how to live. But the social order is based on this phrase, be subject to one another because we're all subject to Jesus. And whatever your, your position is on husbands and wives or parents and children, uh, I get exasperated at some points when I talk to young parents today and how they're raising children. And I think there's a godly way to do it and an ungodly way to do it. There's a productive way and an unproductive way. I don't, that's a rabbit trail. I don't want to go down right now. But it starts with be subject to one another. In other words, be kind to one another. Be gentle to one another. This is the end of where he started, where he said be tolerant with one another. He said this is how you treat each other. You treat each other with, you're a new humanity. You've been made in the image of righteousness and holiness and truth. I'm going to overlook the dumb things you do because you're going to overlook the dumb things I do because we're going to treat each other as brothers and sisters with the same father. Yeah. 
That's what he's after. So we could look at the social order of things, but I think that most of the commentaries and people I hear preach on this don't start with this verse, be subject to one another. That that is the posture that we take. We should be taking this posture that we are subject to one another so that we can put on the new man, be, be, walk in love, walk as light, or in the light, be, you know, being accountable is one of the things you do there. Walk as wise, not foolish, and then be subject to one another. Treat each other with respect. Understand what, what the will of God is, and that we can walk these things through to understand what it means to be the church. Now, I think Tony's going to share something about our Bible study. Is that this week? Yeah. So we're, we're going to study Ephesians. Les Taylor and I are going to study Ephesians and teach on Ephesians for, for 10 weeks starting in the middle of September. We're going to go on Wednesday nights, and I'll let Tony come and share some of that. We're going to dive deeper. We're going to, we're going to do a deeper dive on, on this epistle and give you time to interact and, and have questions, and hopefully we have answers for you. But that's what we're going to do. So this is the second part. Now, next week, I'm going to talk about putting on the armor of God and how we stand against the enemy. Because remember, in chapter 1, he talks about that Jesus has been, been raised far above all rule and authority. In chapter 3, he comes back, and he says that the church is supposed to demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And it's not by just Paul throwing on the end here, oh yeah, let's throw on the thing about warfare. No, that's because this is all part of being a new humanity. Is that the devil hates it. Now, I'll tip my hand right here. This is one of the first things I learned when I was pastoring. Had a very, we were riding a wave. We had momentum. But every time we reached another stage, we would get attacked. I would get attacked. And I remember asking God, God, I'm doing the right thing. We're getting good results. Why am I getting attacked? It's one of the few times I could tell you I heard God as clearly as any voice I've ever heard. He said, you go forward, you get attacked. You quit, you lose. I kept waiting for the third <laughs> option. I wanted like just one more thing, God. Come on, give me, give me the out here. No. Until Jesus comes, you go forward, you get attacked. But if you quit, you lose. That's why the last chapter of Ephesians has the whole idea of stand. So I'm done. I, I, I could preach next week's sermon today, but I'm not going to. Okay, I'll let Tony come. Thank you. You've been great this morning. Thank you. I got this here. Well, as Ray mentioned, um, we're planning uh, for he and Les are going to do a 10-week course uh, on Ephesians, and like he said, it'll be a deeper dive. He he uh, was going through this this morning. I'm like, oh, yeah, this could have been a 15 or 20 weeks uh, series easy because there's just so much there. Um, so I want to encourage you. I know some of the life groups are already looking at switching their night and, and meeting for that. Um, you know, when we do something for eight or 10 weeks, it's like, oh, I got this going on. I got that going on. Um, sometimes you just have to choose to make an investment. Uh, you have to choose to make an investment, and um, everything, everything worth uh, having usually takes some work to get. And I, I believe uh, one of the challenges we face in our culture is that people just know a little bit of the Bible. And I think we're tempted, uh, some of us uh, that are older especially, think, oh yeah, we've had so much Bible teaching. Uh, well, you know, you have to stay sharp. You have to stay sharp and keep going through the process of, of remembering how to dig in the Bible. And I think 
not only for what we'll learn in Ephesians that this course will be good for us all, but just the process of digging in like that, because we'll be able to apply that process to other, other books and other parts of Scripture. So I encourage you to do that. We're going to be uh, advertising it. I'm talking to uh, uh, Pastor Chris at Searchlight. I'm talking to Pastor Bill at Remnant. I've just been building a, a, a friendship with uh, Pastor Michael from uh, Park Church, and we're inviting all of them if they'd like to join us, anybody like that. You can have friends, you can do it. This will be Wednesday nights. Uh, we're planning on starting the 15th of December. So you'll be getting more info on it. There'll be a place to sign up. I'll be, we'll be working on handouts and all of that. September, September. Yeah, we can do it in December again too. <laughs> September. So let's stand together. Father, we are so grateful for uh, the goodness that you show to us, Lord, the, the way you open our eyes and remind us of all that you've done for us, all that you plan on doing for us, God, and in us and through us, Lord. Lord, we, we, we don't want to ever stop growing and, and, and changing, God. We want to be complete in Christ. Lord, we want to be to that place where we're supposed to be. So we ask you to continue to work in us, and especially, Lord, work through us, Lord. Make us have a greater um, fire in us, Lord, to share the gospel, to tell others of this good news that we have received that has made us new creatures, Lord. And we pray that, that everything Ray said today and we'll say next week, well, Lord, will continue to just work in us and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today.